Welcome to the Wish I'd Known Then podcast, where we focus on how authors found success, looking at strategies that have taken them to the top of the bestseller charts, as well as what they've learned from their mistakes. Because being an indie author is more than knowing the latest marketing trend. It's about being innovative and creative and learning from your mistakes. Welcome to Wish I'd Known Then podcast. I'm Sarah Rosette. And I'm Jamie Albright. And this week on the show, we have... Lee Strauss. That's right. We do. And it's really great. Uh, Lee talked about some things we haven't really talked about on this show uh, yeah. before. And I think that's awesome. Um, yeah. Character attachment. Um, she was talking about that. And that's yeah, just, lots of craft stuff. This yeah. one is more yeah. craft heavy than instead of marketing. Although she has some really interesting marketing ideas. Yeah. Yeah. So, and, and working with her spouse and yes. how that goes and stuff. And yes. she's brought him on and it's just very interesting yeah. and uh, talked about spinoffs and mm-hmm. uh, series about how she learned how the, how important series were. Yeah. And yeah, yeah, I think it's, I, I enjoyed it. I, think I did it's too. It was a great good, interview. It was a great discussion. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it, it gave me some ideas too, but she works with her husband. So I need a norm in my life. So, I know. Uh, <laughs> yeah. We joked about yeah. hiring Norm. <laughs> so what's been going on with you this week? Uh, okay. So I have been setting up my office. Mm-hmm. It's coming together and I've started recording a couple of episodes for the mystery books podcast, which mm-hmm. I did that last fall. And I thought, Oh, I'll just, I'll finish my next book and then I'll get back and I'll do another season. And mm-hmm. that was like, I think, it's been too many months. I don't even know how many months it's been, but I am going to do a a season two. It's just Mm -hmm. taking me longer to get to it. So, Mm -hmm. so I started that and um, still working on plans for the next book I'm going to write, but Mm -hmm. I feel like right now I do better if I just do one thing at a time. So yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm going to record the episodes for that podcast and then like dole them out over time Mm -hmm. and then work on my writing during that. Yeah. So that's, that's what I've been working on. Very and, good. Yeah. And yeah, Not that's my tales. Right <laughs> <laughs> so boring. I know. I don't have much either because I'm just working my way through these edits and they're going great and I feel really good about it. But, you know, it's just, it's the, as I say in the podcast, the unsexy work of just doing the work, you know, I mean, that's, Mm -hmm. that's the part that's not very um, exciting. You just have to go through and do the work. Um, But I'm really, I really feel good about this book. I mean, you know, just as far as it, it has actually turned into a real story, Uh, you know, (laughs) Yeah, it's always a good thing that point. Yeah, I was kind of worried <laughs> for a bit, but um, yeah, so that and just not doing much else. Uh, my husband and I kept four of our six grandchildren this weekend, so we're really just recovering um, right now. And um, as soon as we it's get amazing off, the, you got any writing done? Then I know, and I did. I actually got a couple couple of days I didn't, but a couple of days I was able to um, edit the number of pages that I need to edit. And so that was great. Um, but as soon as we get off this call, I'm going to see Black Widow. So ooh, I can't wait. Okay. And uh, so I'll have a report okay. on that next week. Yeah. But we didn't do a question of the week last week because, you know, it's kind of new. So yeah. I think our question of the week should be, could you work with your spouse? And if so, a, what would they be good at? I think that's an excellent question. Yeah. And it's interesting because I used to want my spouse to come on mm-hmm. and help me out. And I've come to realize that he's not really interested in the writing business like mm-hmm. I am. And mm-hmm. so that's okay. I've come to the yep. conclusion that I'm yep. okay yeah. hiring a VA, <laughs> which right. has worked out great. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So some relationships should, should just not go there. And right. uh, yeah, that would be me and my husband. It would not be, you know, we, he just doesn't have any interest. He's interested in the things I'm interested in, but he's not interested in the publishing business. So, um, but some, some spouses are, and it might be something you should think about. So anyway, that's our question of the week and we should get on with the interview because uh, Lee's got a lot of great information to share. Yep. All right. So here we go. Here's Lee. So today we're talking to Lee Strauss. Hi Lee. How are you? I'm good. Thank you. How are you? We're We're great. And we're so happy you're here. Um, this was a uh, kind of a coup for us. Uh, 
Sarah has been telling us, <laughs> telling me we needed to get you on. So I'm very yeah. happy. Yeah. Thank you. Well, thank you for inviting me. Yeah. So let me read your bio real quick and we'll get into the questions. Okay. Uh, Lee Strauss is a USA Today bestselling author of several cozy historical mystery series. She has titles published in German, Spanish, and Korean with French coming soon and a growing audio library. When Lee's not writing or reading, she likes to cycle and hike and stare at the ocean. She loves to drink cafe lattes and red wine in exotic places and eat dark chocolate anywhere. Uh, <laughs> I agree with all. <laughs> great. <laughs> That's so great. Well, Lee, let's start off and just tell uh, our listeners how you got into writing. Oh, okay. Well, that that was a long time ago, and um, when when my children were little, and they're all adults and grown now, and at the time I was just looking. I had four kids under six, and I was just looking for an artistic um, means of expression that they couldn't wreck. <laughs> <laughs> This is why we can't have nice things. (laughs) Yes. So I started off painting and I took painting classes and stuff, but I always had to wait till they had went to bed and everything. And then we were in kind of a small place. So I had to then pull everything out, put everything back. And just right around that time, the, the, um, hmm, geez, I don't know what they're called anymore. You have your dot matrix printer and your five inch floppy disk. Oh, wow. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, I don't know either. I can't remember. So we got our first home computer, right? Uh Yeah. And suddenly this whole new world of, oh, I could do some typing and I could be creative. Mm -hmm. And so I went to the library because I'd always had in my back of my mind on reading these books to kids. And I'm sure lots of people do this when they're reading going, hey, I could do that Mm because it seems a lot easier than it is, right? Correct. (laughs) Correct. When you just read, it's like, but wait, you know, I'm staying at home. Oh, maybe I could write books and make, yeah. make, an, make, uh, money, you know, yeah. make some extra money. Yeah. So I went to the library and I read every single book on writing that they had. And they, there's a subscription called Writer's Digest. So I mm-hmm. read every magazine and then mm-hmm. I just started and that was it. And that was, that was like probably, I'm really aging myself now. That was back in like 1994, oh, wow. 95. Yeah. So it was a uh, something I just kind of chicken scratched at for a long time. And then mm-hmm. when did you did you sell your first book to a publisher? No, no, yeah. I was never that good. <laughs> <laughs> That's not true. No, it no, is I think true. You're doing it quite is well, though. <laughs> I like. I want to say that writing is something that can be learned just mm-hmm. like anything. If you're yep. driven enough to do it, some people are born with, you know, prodigy type genius skills and in, in a lot of different things. That was not me, Neither. but I just liked it mm-hmm. and I wanted to do it and I wanted to succeed. So I did the work and I, you know, I suffered all the rejections and then I learned from those comments when the agents and stuff were kind enough to comment and just mm-hmm. kept kept doing it mm-hmm. and then I mean the thing is you, you I know that you, one of the questions you wanted to ask me was about what I wished I knew about writing or craft and here mm-hmm. is here is the answer to that mm-hmm. <clears throat> is that for a lot of people well for everyone I think you have to write a certain amount of words before you find your voice as a writer, Mm -hmm. you know, and if you're writing, you probably know what I mean by that. If you're not, you, you need to know that that is when something happens. And when you are writing, you're no longer copying another writer's uh, style or you're no longer just writing and sounding exactly like you, like every character sounds like you and looks like Mm -hmm. you and talks like Mm -hmm. you and would do things the way that you would do it. So for some people, they can find their voice of just a few hundred thousand words, maybe, Mm -hmm. and other people have to do a lot more words. Um, But I know exactly when the penny dropped for me and I found my voice and it was many years into the process, but that was a a turning point for me. That's great. That's, that's really great. Mm -hmm. And I think that's so true. And you don't know it's it's kind of I just have been watching Ted Lasso and he um, commented that it's kind of like porn you you know it when you see it well <laughs> finding your voice is kind of the same thing you you know it when you feel it and you hear yeah. it in your writing yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, that is very true. Well, what is your definition of success and has it changed over time? Um, my definition of success, and I took, uh, I had to think about that for a while, but I think it's, and I'm not sure that I've gotten there yet <laughs> because <laughs> for me, it would be finding a real healthy um, work-life balance mm -hmm. and, you know, having enough cash flow in that balance to like do the things that are important to, to you mm -hmm. and accomplish yeah. the things that are important to you to do in life. Um, and so sometimes I'm there. And sometimes I'm not, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> but my goal is to be there more not than, <laughs> than not, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> more than not. I want to have work-life balance. And yeah. that's been a real a goal of mine um, as I'm kind of approaching my sort of retirement years, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I agree with all that, that like, I don't know that I have achieved a work-life balance, mm -hmm. but that's something that. I want to, I want to do better with that. I think mm -hmm. I want to be able to mm -hmm. write and take time off and not feel guilty. And I'm working, I'm getting better, but I still do feel guilty if I'm not writing all the time. And that's unrealistic to expect to be able to write mm -hmm. all the time. So, and to produce a book no. every, whatever X number of months, years, whatever. Mm -hmm. So Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. And you're not really living your life if you're just jumping from one project to the next project mm -hmm. to the next project. But there is this sense, and we're trapped by, I think we're trapped by the algorithms, mm -hmm. right? Because the algorithms are a friend, but only if you feed them. Mm -hmm. And uh, for people who don't know what I mean by the algorithms, I'm mostly talking about Amazon, but it's really anywhere yeah. um, that you're selling your books and you're counting on your vendors, which would be like Amazon, Kobo, Barnes & Noble, Google Play. Am I missing somebody? Um, to help you promote your work, to help you uh, get to yeah. readers. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. To help readers find your work, I guess, yeah. would be the easier way. And so if you want your vendors to help readers find your work, they, they kind of insist that you continually feed the machine. So the mm -hmm. more you give them new material, the more they'll tell readers about you. As soon mm -hmm. as you stop giving them new material, they'll start to stop telling people about you. Mm -hmm. So it's really easy to get into a, um, a dysfunctional relationship <laughs> that can rob you <laughs> of your life. You know? <laughs> I think that's the best description of it I've heard in a while. Richard, Somebody Richard. referred to uh, like subscription models and stuff as a bad ex-boyfriend, an abusive boyfriend. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes mm -hmm. if we're not careful, we can let ourselves get in mm -hmm. a situation where we're doing things that we really shouldn't do for our, our health and mm -hmm. mental mm -hmm. health and all that. Yeah. Yes. True. Yeah. Well, what about marketing? What do you wish you'd known about marketing? When uh, you what do I wish I know about marketing? Well, I think the big thing, and this is something you can't, you know, I mean, when I just want to preface that when I started, because not all your listeners will be starting at the same point in mm -hmm. the sort of sort of history of indie publishing and self-publishing, mm -hmm. it was pretty much at the very beginning. Mm -hmm. So we didn't have access to cottage industries. Yeah. There were, you know, we didn't have like I remember, you know, if I wanted to upload to Apple, I had to figure out how to do HTML code. Mm. And and you had to use like Sigley and Cal Calibra and, and different things. Yeah. Like it was a whole thing. Or if you want to format, you didn't have Valum. You had to like yeah. figure it out on dot on the Word doc. Like everything was a lot harder, and, mm -hmm. and we didn't have access to a lot of information. You didn't have experts to yeah. help you with Facebook ads and Amazon ads, or how to build your newsletter, or um, things like that. Or you know, or people who like you, you guys who are like giving information to writers. Mm -hmm. So there wasn't a lot of information. Everybody was in the school of hard knocks yeah. at that time. <clears throat> but so what I wish I knew and was um, that I, I needed to pick a genre and mm -hmm. stick to it. Mm -hmm. And what I was doing was just, Ooh, I'm inspired. I'm going to write this. Ooh, mm -hmm. this story idea inspires me. I'm going to mm -hmm. write that. Yeah. And the other thing I wish I knew because you kind of only hear all the people who are speaking the loudest was that there was room for, um, for uh, the clean 
and wholesome mm-hmm. genre. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So there was a lot of like everyone who's successful were like the steamy, sexy types mm-hmm. of books, which isn't my my wheelhouse. But I was sort of under the impression that that was what you would have to write in order to succeed. Um, And so I wish that I kind of just stayed true to self, I guess, a little bit there. And I'm not sure if I'm answering the question about marketing, Mm -hmm. but it kind of goes together because it's really hard to market market when you're all none of your books kind of sync up to each other. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If you're writing this genre and that genre Mm -hmm. and that genre. And it's hard to... It's hard to market a book that you've written and don't love because you wrote something that you're not particularly comfortable writing. Yes. So it's very hard to market a book like that. Yes. And and then in those days, too, you didn't have a lot of options when it came to marketing like mm-hmm. we have now. I feel like we have too many now. So we get mm-hmm. overwhelmed by yeah. all of the information and the opportunities and stuff. But <clears throat> Back then, it was really you had to kind of tie your wagon to a successful author and and uh, or, you know, a group of authors would join together and try and support each other, which was good and helpful. I don't know. I think it was helpful for mental health reasons mm-hmm. to be with a group of people mm-hmm. who are all trying to do it. Yep. But whether or not we were actually successful in marketing, promoting our books, I'm not 100 yeah. percent sure. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I do remember that kind of phase when I think um, Fifty Shades of Grey came out, mm-hmm. and it seemed like like that was what everybody was talking about, and that was yeah. what re- there were a lot of new readers, mm-hmm. and there were people that were putting out books that appealed to those new readers. And mm-hmm. I remember it dawned on me after I'd been doing this a while that some of these people that I was the authors that were doing really well, I was like, I think I need to figure out what genre they're writing before I start. Mm-hmm trying to emulate them or use Mm -hmm. them as a pattern for success because the things that work in certain genres may not work in others. So like Mm -hmm. what would work Mm -hmm. maybe for erotica might not work for cozy, you know? So it took me a while to figure that out. And for a while that was the hot trend, you know, and if you were doing that, Mm -hmm. you know, you were at the forefront. Thankfully, I found happening. myself before then. I <laughs> yeah. was more I was more confused and uh, intimidated by the new adult genre. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. That had come because I was writing young adult, and then it, there was sort of felt like this pressure that you kind of had to sex everything up or something mm-hmm. and become new yeah. adult. And um, <clears throat> and yeah, I just it didn't work for me. So then I thought I was really hooped. <laughs> 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 but. Yeah. Um, but then I did start discovering people like Leanne Dobbs and others mm-hmm. who are writing cozy mysteries. But my problem then was I didn't feel like I had the skill set to write a mystery yet mm. because mysteries is a it's a different animal. You're not just writing an entertaining drama or mm-hmm. comedy or mm-hmm. something. Right. You have to you have to be clever. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you gotta you gotta outsmart your reader and that kind of sneaky, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah you gotta you, you got to know how to pose a question and answer that question all in one book. You know, you yes. Know who did it? And here's who did it. Yeah. So, it's and, then, a, and keep it, it hidden until yes. the very last moment. Yeah. Yeah. And mystery. Exactly. So there's a lot of nuances to writing a mystery that you don't have to use or, mm-hmm. or, or tricks of the trade or whatever mm-hmm. that aren't necessary in other genres. And so I felt like I was just starting to master getting my voice and mastering structure for young adult, which was where I was kind of landing at that time. The idea of doing a mystery was just like, I don't know if I could do that. But mystery is where I belong because before I was a writer, and here's a big hint, I was a mystery reader. Yes. So when I went to the library, I always went to the mystery paperback rack Mm -hmm. I never Mm -hmm. went to romance I never went to young adult I don't even know if they called it then maybe they called it or something Mm -hmm. so that's where I went and I would you know and I read all of those you know I was a big Sue Grafton fan be when you know when the ABC Mm -hmm. was only at (laughs) sea and um, Rex Stout and all those uh, those Agatha Christie and those ones and those are what I read so I was definitely intimidated I'm like no there's no way I could I can right. write that. Yeah. So it took a long time before I, I came around to feeling like, hey, I think, I think now I'm there. You know. Yeah. 
Well, that kind of leads into uh, one of the questions that we have is, um, what assumptions did you make at the beginning of your writing career, and did they turn out to be right or wrong? And, I mean, did it, did assuming that mysteries were too difficult, was that something you felt early on? And then, obviously, you worked it out and figured out how to get over that. Yes. Um, so what assumptions I made at the beginning of my writing career, there were two. I, I assumed it would be hard work mm-hmm. and I was right. It was actually way harder and <laughs> way. Wrong because I knew it would be hard work and I was right, but I didn't know it was going to be as hard as it yep. was. Yep. <laughs> so it was wrong. Yes. Um, and then as far as I wasn't good enough to write mysteries was also right. Like mm-hmm. I was, I, you know, you have to be able to accurately assess mm-hmm. where you are in your um, not just your career, but where you are as a craftsman, mm-hmm. where you are mm-hmm. as you're learning your craft of writing, right? And, you know, not being hard on yourself, but mm-hmm. saying, "Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm capable here, but I still need to learn and grow to get to the next mm-hmm. place and the next place." And so, it wasn't until actually maybe the summer of 2016, so not that long ago. Mm-hmm that I felt like I could, I, sh- I could focus on the mystery genre. Cause I had written books that had mystery elements mm-hmm. and call them mm-hmm. mysteries. We call them suspense. Mm-hmm. I call them, you know, time travel books. Mm-hmm. And so I had been, and I understood the whole knowledge gap, not telling everything up front and kind mm-hmm. of making people excited to learn and sort mm-hmm. of little things. So I was already exercising my, how to tell a mystery muscle, mm-hmm. but I hadn't, uh, gone full in, okay, this is a traditional or cozy, whatever. This is a mystery genre first book. Right. And um, how I got there was, was, is, was basically coming around back to, I'm, I'm jumping, I'm, I'm genre jumping too much. Mm-hmm. I need to settle somewhere. And that's when I went back to what do I like to read? I like to read cozy traditional mysteries and that's what I should be writing. And so it kind of came in tandem with another thing where I was, um, and this is an answer probably to another question, mm-hmm. but I'd come across Chris Fox's work on writing to market. Mm-hmm. Right. And that was a real game changer for me because that helped me understand why I had to settle on a genre, uh, not just, you know, for my own sake as a creative person but for my myself as a business person Mm -hmm. and running a business and so when I read his book and watched his videos about picking a genre I did that I like writing to market I went to Amazon I did like he said and I looked at the history or the mystery um category and I screw and I and I you know, scroll down or whatever to all the different categories and I found history mysteries and then I found or cozy mysteries, and I found history mysteries. And at that time, there was hardly anybody on the shelf of historical mm-hmm. cozy mysteries. I, mm-hmm. the Reese Bowen was there, and mm-hmm. there was maybe Francis Brody, mm-hmm. um, maybe Ashley Weaver, yeah. and those were all traditional. And then there was maybe two, maybe two or three. I don't even remember. Hardly yeah. any independent mm-hmm. people mm-hmm. in that right. that market. So that's when I decided I'm going to write there. And also at the time, I was so like in love with the Miss Fisher uh, mystery TV show. Uh And I was heartbroken when I got to the end. So these all kind of lined up at the same time. I realized I needed to settle on a genre. I realized I needed to write to market. And I realized that I was at the end of Miss Fisher. Mm -hmm. And so I'm like, well, I'm going to just write something I want to read. That's in the Miss Fisher-esque genre yeah, and that's how that, yeah. Uh, yeah and that's how you know I came up with the character of Ginger Gold yeah great name yeah. great name and you're you're you really were one of the early indie authors in that subgenre and kind of led the way I feel like for and now it's quite crowded I would yeah think. it is you? pretty crowded there <laughs> <laughs> so I think the uh gold rush opportunity there is probably passed, but um, yeah. I love it. That's one of my mm-hmm. favorite genres. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So Lee, have you ever made a mistake that turned out to be a good thing or something that quote unquote other people say is a mistake, but it worked for you? 
Well, I guess what we consider a mistake is spending as many years as I ended up spending not making any money mm. <laughs> <laughs> and actually losing money. Yeah. Um, yeah. It turned out to be a good thing because ultimately, you know, because I did, I'm one of those sort of um, moral of the story type characters. I'm, mm-hmm. I am the turtle in the turtle in the hair story. I just kept going and going and going. And, and finally, you know, like I said, I started in 94 mm-hmm. with my first home computer. And, <laughs> you know, I did, I started self-publishing in 2012 or 11, 2011. Mm-hmm. Um, and I did go through my fair share of agents. It wasn't like I didn't have any traditional interests. So I did right. know that I was getting to a certain level of quality uh, control that mm-hmm. was, you know, I was getting through the gatekeepers gates to a certain degree. But I never, they could never sell anything for different, whatever reasons. Mm -hmm. So then indie publishing happened with the advent of Kindle and stuff. So that was 2011, 2012. But it wasn't until 2017 that Ginger Gold took off. So, Mm -hmm. you know, I could have quit at any time. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. And and then then I definitely would have felt it was a mistake. I also took a year off work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I had a job I didn't enjoy and I convinced my husband to let me take a year off work because I thought, okay, and this was when I did have an agent. I was working on my clockwise series at that time, which was young adult time travel. And Mm -hmm. that was the book that got me that that my penny dropped. I found my voice and I got my first agent clockwise. Mm -hmm. And I love that book and I love that series. But um, now, what was I saying? Oh, yeah. So I took a year off because my, mm-hmm. you know, I was going to mm-hmm. work with my agent and I was going to get it going. But the year yeah. came and gone and the agent came and gone. <laughs> and I was sitting there with <laughs> no job, no agent, no book deal. Yeah. yeah. Um, so then I went back. I got a part time job after mm-hmm. that. Mm-hmm. So was that a mistake? I don't know. Um mm-hmm. You know, it was a hit financially a little bit, but it wasn't in our case. It was something we could weather. Mm-hmm. And and then I went back part time for two years. And after two years of part time, I started making enough money uh, to equal what I was making full time. Mm. Um, first with the joint, like part time plus my writing mm-hmm. and then after just my writing. And then I was able to let the part time job go. And I was actually quite fine with just that. Uh, mm-hmm. Now I'm making as much as I was making in my full time job. That was that's great. That's fantastic. That was, mm-hmm. that was good. But that was all pre ginger gold too. So um, once I found my sweet spot though, everything, you know, those are all my backlist books now. And are they a mistake? You know, I love them all. I think, you know, you learn something from all the different mm-hmm. books that you write. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Had I just started, like part of me is like, if I just started with Cozy Mysteries back yeah. in 2011 <laughs> or something and saved myself all this grief, but that would be so much farther ahead. Yeah. Um, or I would have gotten to where I am now sooner so that yes. I could have saved myself some stress yes. and yeah. and heartache. But, but yeah, all's well that ends well. That's right. That's right. <laughs> yeah. That's right. So yeah. did, when, did you start pu- indie publishing in 2011, 2012, or was it later in 2017? No, it was October 2011. I self-published okay. clockwise. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then shortly after that, I did another book that's so completely in a different genre called Playing with Matches. (laughs) (laughs) So when... (laughs) I had some of that too. When I first started indie, I was like, just like, I'm almost, was drunk on freedom to write whatever I wanted. (laughs) Yeah. Or you have all these books that you couldn't sell or whatever. Agents would pick up. It's like, okay, I've got this young adult. That's this fun little quirky time travel and now I've got this sort of heavier World War II book <laughs> and that's going to go and now I have all. this like science fiction you know upper teen whatever YA book that yeah. like, people will love them <laughs> yeah that's, I mean yeah I'm just like all over the place and yeah, yeah but, but I think I mean, that but it teaches you something I mean yeah. you know you're right I mean you could have quit at any point and you didn't and mm-hmm. uh, you know that's my big thing you know we only fail when we quit is my mm-hmm. opinion, but um, yeah. so I think that's awesome. Yeah. Well, what about the opposite? Mm-hmm. Have you ever had something that you thought was just such a great, brilliant idea and then it turned out to be not so great? I mean, we all have 
these stories. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think all of my uh, series ideas at the beginning, I thought were fantastic. I mean, clockwise, <laughs> clockwise, I wrote five books in that and I thought it was great. And I actually still think that one's good, except I went, it was weird. Cause like what happened was I wrote it as you didn't think it, I didn't think in terms of series back then. We didn't realize mm. the importance of series. Yeah. So I read, I read, I read a, uh, I wrote a standalone and then there were like pieces of it that didn't really fit. I took them out. And then what I found out was that the readers loved it so much. They wanted another book. And I'm like, mm -hmm. Oh my goodness. Well, maybe I can use this stuff that didn't make the yes. cut the first time yeah. around. And I wrote another book. Cause my idea was I was going to write um, a book with a different character, different time traveler. So the same kind mm -hmm. of time travel world, but a different character. Mm -hmm. This is where I learned about character attachment mm -hmm. and the importance of character attachment because yes. people didn't want a new character. They wanted the same character. So the first right. two books were really good. But then I'd written, I had already written this other character. So I'm going to publish mm -hmm. this book too. And all of a sudden the series is about a different character. And then I'm realizing, okay, that's not working. So I go back, I write <laughs> two more books with the first character and kind of just bring them, meet these two characters meet. So it's completely like a non-linear yeah. type yeah. of series. Mm -hmm. But that one was good. And then I was really excited about my uh, um sci-fi books I don't know why I thought I was a science fiction writer because I liked <laughs> I like I like sci-fi but I was like light sci-fi and then I was yeah. really excited about my romances because they were all musicians which I thought mm -hmm. was different and they were going to be street musicians and I'm married to a musician and I'm very familiar with the whole folk scene world and I had them set in Europe because I was living in Europe mm -hmm. and I thought I had all these really interesting elements and I did and I think the books are good but they just did not go uh, yeah. my, I just couldn't find the readers and people just weren't interested in musicians from Europe I mean mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> so that didn't work so it's a great <laughs> idea that didn't work um, in terms of marketing um, I would say these you know back in the day we had I don't know if you remember when we you got together with a bunch of authors and you put together a bundle of like 25 books and sold the whole thing yes. for 99 cents. Yeah. <laughs> a little insane sounding, yeah. but yeah. <laughs> it was a thing. It was popular was thing. for a while. And that was a stressful thing to do because we didn't have the cottage industries to help us put that together. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then, you know, you finally get it together. You finally get it where it uploads properly and, you know, you're barely friends with anybody anymore. Yeah. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> in the box set because it's so stressful 20, and, 24 of your former friends <laughs> yeah. yes, exactly <laughs> and then you know you don't make any money hardly and if you're not the first one or two books mm -hmm. you don't even get read so yeah. that I would say was kind of dumb <laughs> well, I was laughing when you said you had all these ideas for series and stuff because as we're moving right now I found a box with like my old notebooks and I mm -hmm. found this list of proposals because I was trying to get traditionally published too. And so I had proposal number one, right. proposal number two, and I was reading through, I was going, <laughs> Oh my goodness, these are just not good. I mean, <laughs> they just didn't appeal to me at all now. And I was like, I don't know why I thought these were so good, but mm -hmm. you no, know, mm -hmm. mine gives you mm -hmm. more perspective, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> oh no. Uh, I left too, because uh, you know, I've convinced myself I have wonderful high concept ideas. Like I, I like saying that about myself. I have great high concept <laughs> ideas, but really they're not sometimes. They're just not that good. <laughs> That's so funny. That is well, funny. So um, what's the biggest mindset change you had to make um, during your career? Do you think we've already touched on quite a few yeah. things? So yeah. Um, yeah. It would be the right to market. Yeah. In terms of my career, but I think even as a writer, I'm enjoying right. I enjoying writing more when you're writing something that kind of fits you mm -hmm. and suits you and that and stuff. So yeah, writing to mark, and also you enjoy writing more when your books are selling. That's mm -hmm. just that's mm -hmm. just the that's reality, right? Point, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that writing to market, I had to finish. I was writing another series, a nursery rhyme suspense series. Again, I thought it's a fantastic idea. And it act, I still think it's a fantastic idea. It follow, you know, and I was working on my character attachment, but I did make a crucial mistake in the first book and that I, the first chapter doesn't open with the main characters. 
it's a mm. secondary character. So readers think that she's a main character mm-hmm. you know, and it yeah. doesn't work out that well for her in the book. Yeah. <laughs> <Maybe not that laughs> happy. <laughs> But I, you know, I was like really trying to get this series off the ground and I had to finish the fourth one. And it mm-hmm. it was a whimper and a, you know, moan. It just did not. Mm-hmm. Book I was like, yeah, OK, I got to I got to stop this series. I'm just killing mm-hmm. myself. Mm-hmm. And so that was when, OK, I had already been I had already gone through the right to market. I already decided on the next genre and I was already working on my character of ginger gold. And I had all these ideas in my head, but I had to finish this other book. I just had mm-hmm. to wrap up the series mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. I hadn't, I didn't want to put book three out without it feeling complete. Like if you right. get to the end of book four, if you actually make it to book four, <laughs> the end, you'll feel okay. It's not like, you know, yeah. just, like, like where's the rest of it didn't just yeah. fall off a cliff. Right. Yeah. 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 So I just felt like I had to do that for my own sake. So this was the January. So that, that released in December of 2016, January of uh, 2017, I wrote sort of a novella to get started in this series. And, Mm -hmm. and I, and then I did also the quick release. So I had to plan to do, you know, three books in a row and four books within the year. And, and so I worked the plan and it, and it worked for me. Mm -hmm. So so I kept doing that. Oh, I was going to ask real quick the, about you mentioned character attachment a couple mm-hmm. of times. And so I think that's an interesting thing that we mm-hmm. haven't talked about before. So Mm-mm. do you have any, like, what have you learned about that? Like, how do you help readers attach to a character? Well, I think, you know, developing a very well uh, three-dimensional, four-dimensional person <laughs> character Um where people just want to hang out with them. And I learned this even just, I consider ginger gold books to be like literary Netflix. So when you watch Netflix, why do you watch a series beyond the first series? You're interested in a concept, the first episode, the pilot, this interesting episode. And then you watch the second one because like, Oh, those characters are interesting. And I like the concept by the third one. Mm -hmm. You're not really caring about the concept too much. Mm -hmm. If they did their job, if the writers have done their job and the actors, you're like, I got to find out what this character is going to do this time. I just, you know, I just want to have a glass of wine and hang out with friends, you know, on TV. Right. Mm -hmm. You're not, you're not thinking, Oh, I want to watch a show of three of six, you know, 20 somethings who are trying to make their way in New York. That's the concept that trick, you know, is interesting or in the nineties, that was Mm -hmm. interesting at first. I actually only just watched friends for the first time during COVID. So (laughs) I binge watched it. So I'm like, okay, I get it. Yeah. So, Mm -hmm. you know, they're sort of pitching it as friends or, you know, six friends, you don't even know these people as actors. Mm -hmm. And suddenly you're like, you know, you got to watch the next one. You got to watch the next Mm -hmm. one. And you might not even like what's happening in the show, right. like the, the where the writers have taken it or that particular episode, but you'll watch the next one anyway, mm-hmm. because yeah. you care about what happens to these characters. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, I realize that's what has to happen in my books too. And I learned that when I was talking about clockwise and then I, I suddenly switched to a third different character when people wanted the, wanted Casey and Nate, they're like, eh, I don't want to go see this. I don't want to come back to that. Yeah. And, and so yeah, so that, that that was something I always kept in mind is that, okay, when I'm writing this book, my readers, they they want to hang out with this person. So this person has to be likable. Mm-hmm. They have to be somebody they admire. Mm-hmm. They have flaws. Of course, they have to be identifiable. Mm-hmm. Um, they have to maybe, you know, be have some humor. So because people don't want to be like, you know, feeling depressed every time they pick up your book doesn't mean that yeah. you don't have heavy subjects because my books do mm-hmm. but they talk a lot about the first world war and yeah. mm-hmm. you know loss of first love and and things like that or you know you know street urgence and or whatever on the streets mm-hmm. of london so it's not like it's a you know on um, you know like it's all happy Earth. sunny yeah. all the time yeah yeah no but the character has uh, a, an up sort of p- a perspective of life that's ginger gold she's she's got a you know, a uh, glass half full personality. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So when people, it turns out people like to hang out with her and then they love to follow her love interest arc, right? Cause you mm-hmm. got to have that. And I learned that from Miss Fisher mm-hmm. and her inspector, mm-hmm. <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. So I just kind of learned some things. And then I, you know, I, I, 
interestingly though, I gave Ginger a, at first when I, when I thought about it, I gave, it was going to be a friendship novels like mm-hmm. Ginger and Haley, but I didn't really see it, but it, and, you know, I should have known because I had the love interest that was going to become a, a couple solving mystery yes. novels. So yeah. suddenly I had a third wheel. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I kind of realized partway through that I needed to spin her off into her own series. Mm-hmm. And um, that's a whole nother story if you have another question, but so, yeah, so that's, I think we'll get that, to that was yeah. character <laughs> attachment. Very Hopefully good. that helps you understand that. Yeah, yeah. that's great. That's a great answer. Yeah. I do too. I do too. So we like to ask some specific questions just for you, uh, mm-hmm. Lee. And so one of them is uh, you have a really unusual, fun reader magnet. Why don't you tell our listeners about that and how did you come up with the idea and what's your reader's response to it? Okay. Um, well, <clears throat> When I was coming up with the character of Ginger Gold, I knew that I wanted, like it was 1920s, you know, women had limited uh, access to a lot of things. Mm-hmm. And uh, even though you could still get an education and stuff, it was still limited. <clears throat> and I had to give her a reason in my mind that it would legitimize how she would know so many things, mm-hmm. how she would have information, how she would know mechanical things, how she would know how to pick a lock, how she mm-hmm. would know all these things. And so then I'm like, well, you know, I'll make her a secret service agent from world war one. And then she could learn all kinds of crazy things, how to Mm -hmm. shoot a gun or whatever. I mean, she spent time in America, so she might've learned to shoot a gun there too. But now suddenly I have a legitimate way of giving her um, access to all these skills Mm -hmm. and like she knows all these languages and everything. Okay. Well, she was a spy. So, for my reader magnet, as I was going, as I was re- writing the books, so this was a gradual thing. Mm-hmm. I would like, I need Ginger to be able to do this thing. So I have had to have had her had the experience in the war. And I would write a little snippet about her experience in the war. And that's how she learned how to, you know, use her nylons to make a, a whatever, fix her mechanical problem or whatnot. And so I started keeping track of all these little Things that, oh, you know, she met this person in the war or this Captain mm-hmm. Smithwick, who was like Mr. Bad Guy. He was her 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 uh, officer person in the war. And suddenly I'm like, oh, as I'm rewriting the books, I'm coming up with the backstory. Mm-hmm. And um, then that, that was when I'm like, oh, there's a lot of good little information I need to keep track of anyway. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. So I'm going to just offer this to see if my readers would like this, you know, Mm -hmm. and I'll start her from when she left uh, or actually because her, I also, when I created Ginger, I had to give her, you have to give your characters backstory before they start. And she wasn't that she was just a, um, a a British secret service agent, but she had, you have to give them some kind of scar or something. Right. Right. So internal wound that they kind of have to deal with. And so I had her first husband pass away in the war. Mm. So she was a widow. So then I had to figure out, well, how, you know, I wanted to bring the American British element together. Mm -hmm. So I had, I don't know, I had to figure out a way to get a British man to Boston to Mm -hmm. (laughs) marry her and bring her back. But then her home had to be in London. So that means that her father had to be English. And I had to come up with this whole, how do I work these together? And so that also I had to like, as I was writing, I would throw in all these little tidbits of how she met a first husband Mm -hmm. and, and how we died in the war. So then I'm like, I, I really need to maybe understand these elements better myself. And so we started writing, you know, what it right from, I just thought I'm going to write about Ginger from when she met her first husband, which means her, you know, her first husband had to come from London mm-hmm. to Boston. And basically it was arranged marriage because even though he was a baron and had titles, Lord and everything, they didn't have any money mm-hmm. and the family for different reasons. And so, her Ginger's father was rich. He's uh, also British. And so they were going to make some kind of deal. He was going to bail him out financially if he came and married his daughter and gave her, gave her a title, Mm -hmm. but they end up falling in love anyway. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, so it was really fun to just start writing these little uh, snippets of Ginger's story from the past. And then Mm -hmm. I thought I'm going to just offer these to my readers, get them to sign up for my newsletter. And that also will motivate me to keep writing. Mm -hmm. And so Quite far along in this whole 
um, business too with the journal. We're in the middle right now. My husband Scott came in and started writing them with me, especially when I hit the war ones. I'm like, hey, Norm, want to write? Yeah, <laughs> some exactly. of these World War One. I, I need you to do some research and write about you know this situation in the war. So and it's an so, ongoing thing then, right? Yes, ongoing. it's ongoing. It's not completed. And one thing that I had to, you know, the caveat is these aren't edited. So mm-hmm. these are just, I'm just doing this for, you know, for fun and I hope you enjoy them. And maybe one day when it's all done, mm-hmm. I'll do a big rewrite and package mm-hmm. it. And I probably will do this and, and sell it. So, so you, you, you pose them as Ginger's journal entries. Is mm-hmm. that right? That's yeah. so cool. Mm-hmm. Such a great yeah. idea. Yeah. So you can only access them if you subscribe to my newsletter. And then Fantastic you get, idea. And you get the uh, code, the, the password. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, and um, people, I mean, when I say my newsletter goes out and I add plus new general entries, those ones always open. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> do you put that in your subject line, new journal yes. entries? Yes, oh, I do. Oh, that's great. That is just such a great idea. And it yeah. fits with the time, too. You know, yeah. that, that, you know, yeah. a lot of journal writing back then. That's yeah. great. Yeah. yeah. Jamie has suggested I do that too. And I'm like, oh, in all my spare time, when am I supposed to fit this in? But it is a great idea. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Maybe Norm will want to do yours too. So. Yeah, maybe I can hire him. <laughs> I think he's looking to retire as well. I've got him so he busy. Isn't probably, it, dude? Yeah. He's writing my, the next spin off, the Rosa Reed mysteries. He yeah. writes oh, wow. those. Well, let's do the spinoffs yeah. because we did want to talk to you about that because you've like you Ginger Gold is a long series mm-hmm. and it's, it's like seventeen books, right? Uh, I think sixteen just released, and I I just submitted seventeen to my editor yeah. today. Yeah, so it's it's a long series, but then you've got mm-hmm. spinoffs within that world. So, mm-hmm. how did you come up with the spinoffs? You already touched on Haley, but mm-hmm. um, like. I think it's very interesting that you created this world and it's big enough that you can have multiple series in it. So can mm-hmm. you tell us how that, how you work that out? Sure. With uh, Haley, because like I, I mentioned, Ginger and Haley were supposed to be a friendship book and then it kind of morphed into a, a Ginger and Basil book. Mm-hmm. So then I, I decided I would take Haley out, put her back in Boston, put her in the 1930s, early 30s, and, and give her a friend, Samantha Hawk. And I sort of pitched that as Rizzoli and Isles in the 1930s. <laughs> so the, this yeah. one is staying a friendship book. Mm-hmm. So it's the mm. the uh, love interests and stuff will be more peripheral. However, this series I've had a hard time getting off the ground, mostly because I have not had the time to to market it and promote it and do the quick release and stuff mm-hmm. like that. I can't mm-hmm. write them right. fast enough to put, to release them close together. Mm-hmm. So I was at one point just going to stop after book three because it just didn't seem to get legs. But now that enough people have gone through the ginger series and getting to the part where uh, Haley is spun off, they are mm-hmm. now asking for that. So I, I'm decided I'm going to do at least two or three more and see if that <clears throat> goes. Mm-hmm. But then, um, uh, you know, I have to like introduce my husband, Norm Strauss. He's actually a musician, but now he's a cozy mystery writer. Yeah. <laughs> and, and he came into the picture because, now this kind of takes me to that other thing we had talked about mm-hmm. uh, earlier about um, a marketing mm-hmm. scheme. I'm sort of rabbit trailing, so I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. uh, we can talk about the marketing scheme later if you want to. No, no, go ahead. And, um, I'll finish this and we can talk about that. But anyways, mm-hmm. I had invited Norm to come in and help me write. And so mm-hmm. that was that was working well between us because we could uh, we would brainstorm together, we would do an outline together, and then he would do the rough draft. I would do the rewrites on top of what he's written to bring it into my voice mm-hmm. because it would make sure it would, had my right. voice mm-hmm. and um, and stay true to, to my world and the genre and stuff. And then it would go through the same editorial process as the ginger gold books and the other Mm -hmm. books do. So when we kind of got through that marketing thing that I was talking about, um, (laughs) I'm like, okay, you know, there's no way that I'm going to keep working this hard and you're not Mm -hmm. working this hard. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. (laughs) 
you don't get to retire if I don't get to retire. Yeah. So, <laughs> so like, what's a series that, you know, he could do that I didn't need to be a part of so much. And one of the hard, the difficult parts, and Sarah, you'll agree with me about writing 1920s is the research. It's not as easy to get information about 1920s as you would think. Yeah. Um, just even typical things like you're like, is there a phone booth on every corner in London yeah. in 1923? Yeah. Like yeah. just things British, like that. Specific yes. to, Brit- to Britain because to Britain, a lot of people can find things about the U.S., but that's not what we need, right? <laughs> right. Yes. Or it's just not as they're just like little things too, even like, you know, types of pills or just things mm-hmm. that you or music, what are they listening to, you know, mm-hmm. and all of that. It's just a lot more extensive research that you have to put into yeah. a 1920s book and even a 1930s, even though, but there's more information for 30s. Mm-hmm. But, yeah. you know, I'm like, if we went to the 1950s, you really wouldn't have that issue as much because most people, at least to uh, people who are in my reader group, um, genre or my market, they either remember the 50s, they've either experienced the 50s, or they remember the 50s like they experience it. Mm-hmm. And I fall into that. I was, wasn't was born in the 50s. I was born in the 60s, but life changed a lot slower back then. I feel like I remember the 50s, <laughs> you know, like I know. <laughs> and so I, you know, I, I, and it's not that hard and you can kind of like grab, you kind of, they're just things that, you know, already existed, even just from television and music and stuff. You already know certain things, you know, mm-hmm. about driving, you know, about the roller skates, you know, about mm-hmm. the clothes and right. the music and the slang. It's all easy to find. And so mm-hmm. that is kind of why we settled on the fifties. And then because I wanted to keep it attached to ginger, we worked out the timeline. We're like, Oh, it could be a, a, a child, a daughter of gingers. Mm. And so that's how we kind of kept it in the world. So the book I'm just submitted to my editor today, and it is like the summer of 2021, is the book where this character is born. Oh, that's <laughs> in great. 1926. And so she has her own. And so actually the eighth book in the Rosa Reed series is being released this summer. And mm-hmm. we are bringing the two worlds together. Mm. Rosa, I did sort of the opposite. Like with Ginger, I took her from Boston to England. And from Rosa, I brought her from England to California. And I gave it fictional town this time, too. So that also <laughs> makes it easier yeah. Yeah. with the research and stuff. Yeah. And um, so in book eight, we actually, she actually goes back to solve a sort of her kind of deep wound crime. Her mm-hmm. best friend was murdered, and, and that was a cold case. So she goes back, and she's working now with Ginger. Um, yeah. to solve that. So it's kind of bringing the two worlds together so, there. Do That's you find great. your readers, like, do they find Ginger, read through that, and then they're interested in the spinoffs? Or do, they, do you have readers coming in at all different points in I your world? I think we do have them coming in at different points. Because I do have some readers who told me they won't start Rosa Reed because they're afraid of spoilers for ginger oh, gold. Mm, so I have to like reassure fun. them that there are no spoilers, <laughs> mm-hmm. you know, so I have to be very careful with Rosary that I'm not like, you know, yeah. that I'm not giving away anything that hasn't happened yet in the series. Mm-hmm, right. um, so I have to be kind of vague about some things mm-hmm. <clears throat> that way. But um, yeah, but I mean, Rosa Reed is, has has found readership, and a lot of them are Ginger Gold readers too. But I think some are coming in because they're finding the fifties, and then they're like, "Oh, it's connected to because that's the back matter." You know, I tell about right. Ginger, mm-hmm. and then they go only they, they find Ginger that way too. That's yeah. amazing. That's so great. So smart. A series within a series, mm-hmm. and that's that's how you keep readers coming back and staying, <laughs> sticking around. So yes, that's so good. Well, what was your marketing? Uh, thing tell yes. us that real quick before we wrap okay. up okay yeah. yes um well you know as i was going along you know this sort of quick release algorithm machine i wanted to i thought you know i just want to give it a real good like good boost so boost. i don't just feel mm-hmm. like i'm behind it on it and just really mm-hmm. get the soe sir the search engine optimizations sort of working for me mm-hmm. So I made myself a challenge to that. I'm like, okay, for the next 12 months, I'm going to publish something once a month. Mm. I'm going to publish something. It doesn't have to be a full novel. So I had my novels already Mm -hmm. kind of mapped out. um, But so I had some gaps. And that was where I, you know, I had Norm writing uh, the journal entries. 
And he was just like, you know, I can do that. It's only like a thousand words. And that, you know, it's for the war and thing. Mm-hmm. So then I was like, hey, do you want to write some short stories? It's really only like tagging 10 of those together right, right. <laughs> to make a short <laughs> story. 10. It's yeah. really not that big a deal. And I'll <laughs> help you. <laughs> yeah. So the first one we did, we never did end up publishing because that's how it goes. But the second one got mm-hmm. better. And I was like, okay, that one works. And then the third one. And so, and then that's what you mean by bundle. We put two short stories together in one book to, because we were just selling them for, I wanted to sell them for two ninety nine. So I wanted to make sure they were like kind mm-hmm. of worth that price. Yeah. And that was, you know, and then we did this, you know, the same, you know, went through the same editorial process. And then I would fill in the gaps with these Lady Gold Investigates. So these weren't murder mysteries. They were just mm-hmm. mystery mysteries, little mm-hmm. things gone missing or something, something. And so um, <clears throat> I was able to fill in the gaps with those. And then there was like, uh, I was like, I was saying there was like around Christmas, I bundled together a bunch of books for Christmas, I think. And mm-hmm. then I did for Valentine's Day, I did a little short story with another author, Beth mm-hmm. Byers, and just different things to kind of fill in the gap for one year. And it really did. It did boost um, my sales for sure. And my uh, readership and everything, but it's not sustainable. It's not not something that Mm -hmm. you can do. And so I, um, so it was after that when I started to like, okay, I got to start life, the life work balance. I got to start not Mm -hmm. releasing on some months and having some non-release months and then also not having to write all the books. And so that was when Norm and I, um, now that he'd gotten used to writing, Mm -hmm. you know, short stories. So Mm -hmm. short stories, 10,000 words. And now you've written two short stories. That's 20,000 words. You just think of it as four short stories. And now you've got, (laughs) yeah, exactly. (laughs) you've got an actual book. And so now he's like, you know, the first one was daunting, but now that he's into like book eight, he's just, he's just scooting along. And so that sort of relieves some of the, the pressure from me I still have to rewrite it's not like I have it's free for me Mm -hmm. but I don't I don't have to do the first draft so that's that's nice I think you're the first person that we've talked to or that I've heard of whose husband actually helps with the writing I think almost everybody else we know that the spouse works with the author it's like they do the marketing or the ads or whatever so yeah and I mean that I think it's a great system I'm going to send this episode to my husband and say hey you need to get well, your if you have a creative right. husband. So when, because like you know, if you have a creative husband, he's a singer songwriter, so he already has yes. a skill yeah. set for writing, mm-hmm. right? And he's a skilled songwriter. Mm-hmm. Um, so it was just a small step, really. It was like, mm-hmm. okay, just you know, just start writing five hundred words, a thousand words, and just kind of changing mm-hmm. sort of the the medium of what you write. But the actual skill to write was already there. Mm-hmm. So it was just sort of changing it. But what I do do is I had for those first few years with Ginger Gold, I had hired my my daughter-in-law to work as my assistant. She wasn't mm-hmm. my daughter-in-law at the beginning, but she ended up being my daughter-in-law. But yeah. <laughs> she left and went back to school. And then my son came in and took took her place. And so he's actually a... Um, and a visual he's a he's also a singer songwriter but he's also a visual artist and we're mm-hmm. doing a coloring book together oh that's great uh, that, that so he's doing the um uh he, he also was really into nostalgia and um you know former times mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and so he's doing all these uh uh, ginger gold type of inspired 1920s inspired sketches for our coloring book and we're now working on an e-commerce store together called vintage is you and it's going to be uh all kinds of products that feature his art but also my books Mm -hmm. that's that's amazing that's our creative that is so great yeah 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 Yeah. Mm -hmm. well what's the best thing you've done to set yourself up for success do you think Mm -hmm. Hmm. set myself up for success Oh, that's, that's a loaded question. I, mm-hmm. cause I guess just showing up, like I said before, mm-hmm. you know, just mm-hmm. showing up, doing the work, not giving up, um, taking time off when you need it to yep. re- refill the tanks, mm-hmm. um, celebrating when you have things to celebrate and not taking it too hard when things don't go your way, you know, yep. sort of just sort of shaking the dust off and then coming back to the to the desk, you know, starting again. 
I think that's so awesome. That's just <laughs> such that's just such good advice. I mean, it's it's not um, particularly sexy, it, but it's very it's, it's very, very practical. Yes, very practical, and you know something that I I need to hear, and I think a lot of people need to hear because you know not everything's going to go your way, mm-hmm. and uh, yeah. So yeah, I think yeah. that's awesome. Yeah, I had a writer friend one time that she said um, it's not the uh, most talented who always make it, it's the ones that don't give up, you know, the ones that are the most persistent. And I was like, well, I'm persistent. I can, yeah. I can stick with it for a while. So, no, yeah. That's true. That's oh, very yeah. true. Well, it's been great having you leave. Can you tell mm-hmm. our listeners where they can uh, find you and your books? Absolutely. Lee Strauss books. Mm-hmm. com, And that's Lee L E E. Right. Very good. And we'll have the links in the show notes Mm -hmm. for everybody. Okay, perfect. Yeah, And those will be at wishidknownthenpodcast.com. And thanks to Alexa Larberg for editing and producing the show. And we'll see everybody next week. All right. Bye-bye. Thanks so much, you guys. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Wish I'd Known Then podcast. We hope this episode inspired you, empowered you, and made you laugh a little bit too. If you loved it, tell your friends about it. And if you feel so inclined, leave us a review. We look forward to being with you again next week.